My name is Derek McGarry. I'm a, uh, a, a professional engineer, mechanical by background. I've uh, been working in HVAC since the late 90s, um, initially as a, as a design consultant. Energy analysis was the first thing I, I worked on, and then um, over the years morphed into existing building commissioning, retro commissioning, then uh, did a few years of energy efficiency finance during the um, Obama stimulus days. There's lots and lots going around for that. And um, that morphed into uh, introduction to technology to do monitoring-based commissioning. So we started doing shared savings retro commissioning contracts using uh, analytics to keep tabs on our projects. So fast forward a few more years, um, I started a company a couple years ago called Auto, and we figured out how to apply the same types of technology we use for fault detection or monitoring based commissioning to apply it to new construction. Where there is no network, there is no internet, um, and sometimes contractors are not even ready for you yet. Um, so that's the broad um, uh, uh, topic today is, is about automated functional testing. Um, it's, it's, and I, I, I think for a lot of you it might be a new terminology. Um, I know just to give credit where it's due, there's a, um, one of my favorite uh, commissioning providers uh, somewhere in California, I won't say them by name, I don't think they come to this conference often, they're with the, the other group, um, uh, those folks that meet in the fall. Uh, but um, they came up with this concept called, I'll attribute to them, connected commissioning. So, so broadly speaking, connected commissioning is about connecting commissioning providers to the control system so that we can do our jobs better. Um, but uh, focusing uh, today on um, uh, a part of connected commissioning, automated functional testing. So let me uh, fast forward here a little bit. So the traditional AIA slides. Course description. Uh, this is the long version. I, I realize it's too long. They put a nice short version in the program, so that was good. And um, some learning objectives. Uh, what is automated functional testing? Um, and everything you need to know about automated functional testing from a commissioning provider's perspective. Um, so again, today, sample no more. How automated functional testing enables 100% testing. So when you think about what your goals as a commissioning provider are, um, and by the way, I'm focused on HVAC here, so I apologize for not mentioning other systems. Um, I'm not, uh, well, I am ignoring them on purpose. I'm not claiming that commissioning is only HVAC, but that's what this um, presentation focuses on. So we wanna make sure that the systems work the way they were intended, the, owner, the way the owner intended them to work. So what that's going to entail, you know, all the way from pre-design to uh, through warranty phase is traditional timeline of the, you know, whole new construction commissioning process. Um, part of that is testing the equipment to make sure it works properly, the functional testing. So a traditional scope, you have the big stuff. That's always fun to commission. Um, it deserves a lot of time, uh, considering how much energy it uses and how much money it costs to install it. Um, then you have all the zone level equipment. And the zone level equipment, commonly we sample. We only do some of it. So, you know, what, what it depends on the project, but what the problem there is, you know, if we do sampling, if, there's a, if there are systemic issues here in the sampled subset that we're testing, you can solve those with the contractor and it will apply to all of the zones. So that's, that's great, that, you know, that's, that's kind of the premise behind sampling. But the difficulty is there's lots of other issues that are arguably random. They don't, um, they're not systemic. It's a box by box type of thing. And here I have uh, a, a diagram of a, a VAV box pulled up and all those red X's are failure points. And um, a couple uh, interesting ones, um, the 
the one at the uh, top is the supplier. You know, that's not really necessarily something you would, um, you would call a failure at the box level, but what if that box, that terminal unit, isn't subscribed to the static pressure or supplier temperature reset sequence of the parent air handler, and it doesn't get enough static, or doesn't get a low enough temperature, or, or, or temperature's too cold, whatever it is. There's so many failure points, it, it's important to look at everything. It's important to look at every zone. So when you apply these random issues, you know, all these red dots, those, those ones that aren't in yellow are the ones that we're missing. And you don't know where they are. Those are headaches later. That, that, that's a whole stream of stakeholders that will have to deal with that in the first year of operation, starting with the occupant who gets grumpy because something's not comfortable where they're doing work, which is the whole purpose of the building to begin with, is the people inside of it. Then that goes to a you know, real estate manager with the corporate entity or university or whatever, you know, hospital, whatever it is. It goes up the line, you end up with 10 people, including a contractor, trying to resolve these warranty issues. It eats up to everybody's time and people get grumpy about it. So we don't like that to happen, of course, but the nature of how much it costs to do 100% testing um, essentially requires us to do sampling sometimes. It depends on the project. So one solution is to just increase your scope. Do 100% testing. Lots of applications warrants that in the old way of doing things, what I'll call traditional throughout this presentation. So hospitals, data centers, uh, science buildings, laboratories, those types of applications, the owners will be more willing to pay for 100% testing. And that's what it comes down to. It costs a lot of money to do that kind of testing, that level of testing. And we'd love to be paid to do it, but you can't always do that and the owner's not willing to. But as professionals, it's not just about money. <laughs> it's satisfying, it's, it's, being, it's being satisfied with the service we're delivering. And so if we're stuck with this scenario, we're left with unknowns that we're not comfortable with. It's just not as satisfying to leave problems on the table. So the topic of today's presentation is how to use automated testing essentially drives down that cost and enables 100% testing to be less expensive than your current 10, 20% sampling approach. So the traditional approach, um, all sorts of details left out of this, but just trying to give you the general gist of it as a contrast to what we'll cover next is the automated approach. But the main things are, you know, you draft a, you draft a, a test script, uh, provide it to stakeholders for their review and blessing and feedback and make sure everyone's aware of what you're going to be testing. You, you physically meet the contractor on site. Um, I, I did have one person tell me about how they, they'll do a, essentially a, a Zoom and, and, and connect remotely with the contractor. So there's, there's variations to this, but generally speaking, you're going to go on site and, um, and, and sit there with the controls contractor and direct them of what you want to have happen. I want to force heating. I want to force cooling. I want to force economizer conditions. I want to force, um, a, a, you know, CO2 demand controlled ventilation scheme. Whatever the sequence is that we need to force, you're going to ask the contractor to make that happen. And you might get specific. You might tell them exactly what points to change. It's a, you know, it's up to you. Some folks get excited about that. Some leave it up to the contractor. Either way, there's at least two people involved on site with travel time to get there. And um, uh, then you're watching them do all this stuff. You're manually recording the results. I would imagine you, you for your own immediate benefit, you don't necessarily need to record the results because you're going to see problems live while you're there on site. And you'll probably solve some problems live on site with the contractor. But part of the process is you must document everything. It's going to save you down the line. It's going to enable you to backtrack and figure out what you missed or didn't miss throughout the process. So that takes a lot of time too, this documentation. And there's wonderful vendors here at the conference that help you with that documentation. Um, 
the, the challenge is that, that you often run into is, I uh, just ran into this in a, in a project um, out in California a couple months ago, the commissioning provider was told that they could start functional testing on a Monday. We hooked them up with a uh, remote connection the previous Thursday, and instantly you saw, as is often the case, the systems are not ready to be tested on Monday. That was a two and a half hour drive, one way to get there, so five hours of the day that commissioning agent would have wasted. Well, you'll do something on site. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll harvest a little bit of value from that site visit. Don't get me wrong, but the bottom line is there's a lot of running around in circles involved in the commissioning process, and it's not always in our control. And so you end up redoing things. You have to reschedule another time to come out. And then what about um, all the issues you find? You know, how often are the systems 100% satisfactory the first time you test them? I haven't hit that scenario yet. Um, I'm, maybe it exists, but then you're looking at doing retesting. Is that in your scope? Well, maybe one retest. What about a second time? Do you really get through all of the issues before the project closes out? That's extremely rare. Some clients will demand it, and so you will do it. But rare, usually that doesn't happen. What you would need to do to get through all those issues is lots of site visits, and you just aren't paid to do that. And of course, you have something in your contract that says, oh, the contractor's gonna pay you to do that. Good luck. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen very easily either, and there's a lot of friction involved in that process. Now, an overlay that we need to pay attention to is I hear this from all the commissioning agents I talk to. On average, commissioning providers are budgeting about 30 minutes per zone device for commissioning. So when you're sitting there on site, you know, doing 200 terminal units, uh, maybe over a two or three day period, the key word here is sporadic. You're a person. You can only look at one thing at a time. You know, you, 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 you look at a table of, you know, 100 boxes and, and the control system graphics, if they're ready for you, which isn't usually the case either. Um, so you're, you're really not spending as much time as maybe you would like. But again, it comes down to cost benefit and you're, you're, you're paid for your time. So in contrast, an automated functional testing process, um, I'll get down to the bottom part, you can do whatever method of script you want to do. You can do it as long as you want. I mean, we've done radiant systems where um, uh, it takes a longer time for spaces to react to, um, to the radiant cooling or heating. And so who's gonna sit there and wait two hours to see how long that it takes for that space to you know, come up to temperature or come down to temperature or whatever. Um, normally you, you just turn, you know, you say for a VAV box, you know, put it in heating mode. Does the valve start to open? Does the temperature start to increase? Check, move on to the next one. That leaves a lot on the table. You don't really know how that box operates by just seeing a reaction. A positive reaction is not a positive conclusion. So being able to extend your test script to whatever duration you want is quite a luxury. But if it's a luxury and it doesn't cost much, that's the key here. Um, so the process, because it's an automated process, naturally there's technology involved. So you're collecting trend data continuously. You can have the contractor do that or you can do it yourself and have independent trend data well before functional testing, well, I should say weeks before, um, and you see visibility of everything in the system. Then the overrides that the contractor would usually make on your behalf, you know, and if they're savvy, they know how to do bulk overrides and, you know, not waste your time too much, but these overrides are automated now. So it's just like, it's just like um, having the contractor do it, except they're not doing it. So there's two, two, two key points here. One, they're saving time as well. They don't have to sit there doing all this stuff. So now they can focus on what are the priorities. At this stage of the project, there are lots of things going on. And for a commissioning agent to get in the way and ask for hundreds of CSV files is an uncomfortable request. You want it, you need it, you don't always get it. 
you want to see the trend data and the, uh, the control system graphics, that's the low priority. They need to get that chiller working. They need, they need the, the, the smoke dampers to be tested or whatever. Like there's just so much going on, you can't do everything. Um, so um, uh, 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 automating the process not only saves you time, it saves the contractor time. And then the next part of automated um, testing is automatically answering your functional questions. Um, if you can do an equation in your head or on paper, so can a computer. I mean, it's not rocket science. Um, and then another key thing is schedule testing whenever you want. Nights, weekends, holidays. Again, there's so much stuff going on on site that your testing could be interrupted. You have to organize or collaborate or whatever, arrange logistics with you know, five different stakeholders to make sure that you're clear to do testing on Thursday and Friday. Well, you know, there could be someone like a painter doing something that causes, you know, I don't know, it just interrupts your testing. There's so many things that can get in the way of testing. So being able to schedule testing in the wee hours or on the weekends or on holidays is a huge benefit, but you don't have to. You can schedule it while you're there if that's the nature of how you want to do your project. And then I think the, um, the key part um, I added in here I, I think is important to point out is review results. Automated functional testing is not automated conclusions. We are professionals in here. Automation and technology is a tool to help us do our jobs better. You are still the expert. You still decide at the end of the day what is acceptable and what is not for the owner's project requirements and what is worth uh, uh, passing over to the contractor to resolve. So there's still labor involved. You still need to review stuff. Um, so starting with how it works, how do we get connected? Um, this is a typical kind of generic uh, a uh, BACnet based uh, uh, network architecture. Um, it's got a variety of, uh, of uh, protocols on it. You got uh, BACnet over ArcNet. ArcNet, some uh, manufacturers, vendors of control systems use that. Supposedly a little faster, but there's also some proprietary tricks behind it, that's why they do that. Um, MS BACnet MSTP is the most common these days. Uh, that's, you know, controllers daisy chained together with a twisted pair cable serial communication, uh, you know, it's not, it's not gigabit inter internet or whatever. It's, it's, you know, a pretty slow network, but that's the most common. And of course you could have IP devices as well. This diagram doesn't show those IP versions where you have every, uh, uh, every, um, every uh, uh, controller, you know, VAV box controller has actually got an ethernet cable going to it and uh, it's got an IP address. That, that could also be attached to this network. Well, normally, prior to functional testing, that piece on the top left, this, this workstation, your front end for the graphics, doesn't exist. It's not there for you. The controls contractor plugs in their computer, usually looks at non-graphical things to help you do the testing. Now, you'll need to check the graphics eventually. That's part of your scope normally, but that ain't ready in the time for uh, functional testing normally. And so to do automated functional testing, we just hook up a gateway to the network. Now, I have it shown here being uh, connected to uh, whatever, you know, the IP trunk, if you will, uh, but it could really be connected anywhere on the subnet. So these um, top level field panels, they all come with two service ports normally. The controls contractor is going to plug into one of them. And you can plug in, you know, a 10 story building, you can plug in on the fifth floor into the service panel, field, uh, the uh, floor level panel, and you can see the entire building. So, similarly, and contractors do this all the time, they'll plug a um, uh, cellular router into the network so that they can do their work remotely too. Um, so, there's a variety of ways to make that connection. You know, you could cobble together, you know, a cell phone hotspot and uh, you know, a laptop or whatever. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do it, but this day and age, obviously, cybersecurity is going to be the number one concern. And 
that's a difficult topic for a lot of us to get our arms around. And so I've got up here some considerations to think about. Uh, my favorite way of making connections is to establish a virtual private uh, network. Um, and the key here is there's no firewall changes required. It's outbound only, no port forwarding, no static IP, no inbound ports ever. Now people, your, your, your minds might, might start going to the idea of, okay, outbound only, well, you said automated testing. That requires commands, overrides. So how do we do that in an outbound only scenario? This is a common issue. It took me years to get my arms around this. From an IT perspective, outbound communication does not disallow inbound actions. And, what I, and I'll give you a good example. If you're working for some corporate entity like a bank, with high level of IT security, they're gonna allow you to access Google from your computer. That is outbound communication. You type something in your Google address bar, you are initiating communication from inside the network and it allows Google to respond back to you. So that's what, that's what, that's what we're doing here. So we're uh, uh, putting, uh, you put a gateway on the system that enables outbound communication that establishes that virtual private encrypted tunnel uh, and enables you to then send commands back. Um, that's the, the kind of the fundamental of, of, of allowing this network connection. Now remember, for automated functional testing or functional testing period, we're talking about construction phase of the project. So how often is the owner's network ready? How often is internet available on site? Sometimes it is. Uh, oftentimes it happens right in the middle of testing, conveniently. Um, so utilizing a solution with cellular becomes highly valuable. You can gain access to full trend data of the entire systems weeks before functional testing. You can have full transparency of what's going on. Is air flowing? Is the boiler producing hot water? Is the chiller functioning? You know, is that third floor that they were having issues with, did they finally figure it out? Like you can ask in these weekly meetings or whatever, you'll get bad answers sometimes. Sometimes nefarious, sometimes not. There's lots of things going on on a construction project. So, you know, I, I ran into an issue the other day where um, we hooked up a, uh, a project in, um, in California. Uh, Kaiser Permanente was the owner. Um, the contractor said they'd be, this was the, I think I used this example a little bit ago. The contractor said they'd be ready on Monday. Well, half of the boxes didn't have airflow, um, so there's no need to go out there to do testing on Monday unless you want to try to resolve that issue, which you're welcome to, but now you know what your game plan is on Monday. So what it was was the electrician was doing some smoke damper testing and there's a failure of one of the smoke dampers and it wouldn't stay open, so there's no airflow to that section of the building. It took about six weeks to resolve that. So how many times would you be wasting time trying to you know, do this functional testing? Instead, if you have a remote connection, just log on and take a look. See, did they solve that issue? Did they solve that issue? Did they solve that issue? You don't have to rely on other people to tell you the answers. You know with data, transparently, what's going on with the systems. Okay, so next step. We get connected to a control system how do you see what's on there without the help of the contractor? And that's, again, crucial, because we don't want to be, um, or I should say, one of the benefits of, of connected commissioning and automated testing is that it saves everyone time, the contractor included. So typically, when you log on, uh, uh, connect to a BACnet uh, network, you're going to see all these points. And I've got an example on the screen here um, uh, of a points list for a, this is a water source heat pump. Um, in an elementary school. There were 83 points that showed up on the BACnet network associated with a water source heat pump. Well, we don't need that many points, and I'd, I'd imagine uh, a good chunk of them are junk. That are just part of the canned program that the controls contractor uses. Um, so which ones do we need? So you gotta find which ones you want. Uh, so here's on the right side is a condensed list of points that we want for this water source heat pump to do automated testing on. Um, and another note about that, normally, you know, in, in, when you look at a scope for um, 
uh, for uh, the controls contractor, um, the, the trending that's required at the end of the project for the operator's benefit, you know, you've all seen it, so, but I'm going to say just whatever from my observation, it appears to be on average five to seven points for a terminal unit. Um, it's kind of, I mean, we're all engineers here. It's kind of lame. You know, we want to look at a lot more than that. And so you might want to see more like 12 to 15 points for a typical terminal unit. Well, when you're going to do automated testing, we're going to need even more because there's some details that matter. Um, a quick example, a lot of times there are set point limits. Like you can't adjust the set points for a space you know, beyond 68 and 72. Well, if you want to force high heating or high cooling, you might need to go uh, you know, higher or lower than those set points. So uh, you'll want to have, here it is here, heating set point max and min. You'll want to be looking at those and you'll want to be able to override those. So that's what I got highlighted in this upper right here is it's important to know which points you want to override or you need to override for the test. Um, and, uh, and, and, and BACnet enables that to happen. Um, Tritium Niagara also has a, uh, 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 they call it in Haystack. It's an open kind of industry standard or protocol that enables communication between different technologies. Uh, so Tritium Niagara is very helpful for uh, connecting, for third parties, I should say, to connect and override points. BACnet allows it. Uh, a lot of OEMs do have little blockers they'll put in place to disallow that, uh, oftentimes for real good, good real, real good reason. Um, and so sometimes a checkbox may need to be unchecked uh, to enable BACnet. Um, so we, 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 we figure out what the points are that we want, assign them aliases that make sense to us. Uh, a lot of times what you find in the uh, control system you know, stuff is, is, is acronyms that you may or, not, may or may not be familiar with, but um, uh, we like to standardize them. And then we're going to start trending data. So that's the first step, start trending data. Are we getting the right data? Does the data make sense? Is that discharge air temperature set point, um, you know, a reasonable number? You know, there's easy ways to tell whether, whether it's bad points or bad sensors by the values of those points. Um, but one thing I'll point out here is before we do any automated testing, uh, this was an example where, um, uh, the commissioning provider uh, hooked up a gateway and then a few hours later data was starting to trend without doing any automated testing they immediately saw something that needed to be changed um, so you got severe cycling you got hot cold hot cold heating cooling heating cooling these water source heat pumps the reversing valve is going back and forth uh, stage one is uh, in this case is is heat and then um, uh, 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 when it, then when it goes to cooling mode, uh, these were economizer conditions, so you see the economizer dampers, the blue line in the middle, that's swinging up and down, swinging up and down, swinging up and down. And then heat's turning on and off, heat's turning on and off. And then you see uh, space temperature in this little band up here is, is going up and down, up and down, up and down, in and out of the set points, which are two degrees apart. You know, so that causes a lot of uh, excessive cycling. So that was just quick, easy things that you get right away just from looking at the data. Uh, so the next step, we want to make sure that overrides work properly, that we are able to independently override the values we need to override to automate our functional test or manually do it. Either way, I mean, do it independent of the contractor is kind of nice. Um, and independence matters. Um, Quick example, if you're testing a, a reset sequence on an air handler, uh, there's often a data point coming from the control system that tells you what the critical box damper position is. You're trusting that that's the critical box damper position. If you do it yourself, you're looking at every single downstream box, or to say if you do it independently, you're looking at every single downstream box and you're coming up with your own critical damper position. So it's a, a check and balance. You're always providing an independent view of what's going on. But um, back to the overrides. So here's an example of a, um, this looks like a, uh, this is at a university. Um, this is a VAV box test sequence. You'll see it roughly started at 2 a.m., went to 8 a.m. Um, 
and you see the, these are uh, zeroed in on the heating and cooling set points for the space. So, you know, we drop the set points to force cooling, put them back in neutral, raise the set points to force heating, back to neutral, then we do the whole series in, um, in unoccupied mode. So we need to be able to override those set points, we need to be able to override occupancy. So we have to validate that that can happen and that the overrides go back to the way they were. Then, do your test. So your test is your script. You develop scripts day in and day out for every project. And in that script, that manual traditional script, are a lot of overrides that the contractor will be doing on your behalf. Now, with automated testing, you're doing it. And if you figure out how to do it on one box, multiply that by a thousand or dozens or however many you need to do. Um, so then you run your testing. And um, uh, you know, while we're doing these overrides here on the top, down on the bottom I have an example where it actually shows the uh, box uh, flow set points, heat men, and max, as well as the live set point versus the live actual measured airflow. And this one looks, this one looks pretty clean. So then answering functional questions. Again, if you can do it in your head, so can a computer. So um, you have a computer to answer the questions for you. So there's, there are some examples on the right side of the screen of some, of some questions that um, you know, we're commonly able to answer with, uh, with a computer. I'll spend some more time on this side of the room. I'm gravitating over there too much. Um, so now, just one thing I wanted to point out is, is you know, this doesn't necessarily, um, how do you say, if you're sampling, systemic issues uh, are, 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 are good catches. Because if you sample, you know, you do 10% of the boxes, you find a systemic issue, then, then they solve that and it carries through to all the boxes. Um, so, um, uh, being able to see electronically and quickly when you wake up in the morning and you ran through 200 boxes of testing while you slept, how many boxes satisfied each of your functional questions? That's one way to uh, easily see was there a systemic issue. So in this case, um, this is an old example, so I, I was a little struggling to figure out exactly what was going on here, but I think essentially what's going on here, because I, I have got an example coming up soon, is the, um, whenever there's a call for airflow, it's like goes to max, period. It, like it, it never went to uh, men or, or heating. Um, so that was a systemic problem. Um, then reporting. Can you automate reporting? That would be fantastic. Um, it's all possible with technology. Uh, so then what are some things that naturally you probably are going through your head that we can't do with automated testing uh, or shouldn't do with automated testing. There's some life safety aspects. Now, the nice thing about doing um, automated testing on terminal units is there's not as much in terms of anything critical going on. Is it 12 or 12.15? Okay. Good, good, good. Um, so there's physical activities that obviously a computer can't, can't replace, but, um, uh, but a computer becomes a supplement. Again, we're all experts here. Computers have always been evolving to help us do our jobs better and, and, and use our time more valuably. Um, so let's go through some examples. Here's a simple um, outdoor air uh, VAV uh, test uh, you see on the far left. Um, you know, the, the, at when, when the building becomes occupied, the outdoor air damper for the floor goes open, but there's no airflow, it's automatically detected. The middle example is low airflow, automatically detected. The right example is a good one. Um, so the answer is positive in that case. Um, another example, yeah, here's the one where, where the airflow is crazy. Uh, when we first did the testing on the top left, um, and then once the contractor resolved and did proper uh, programming for the boxes, the bottom left is the trend of what the airflow should be doing in each of these modes, uh, occupied and unoccupied, cooling and heating. Um, an example for uh, VAV air handlers. Uh, now these are a little bit more complicated to run automated testing on, as you would imagine. 
but uh, I, I used that example earlier. I talked about the, um, the resets, being able to validate the resets. It's a tricky thing to do, um, especially if you're sitting there in a mechanical room with the controls contractor. Um, they can point you through their logic, you know, which I think they often do, but there's, you know, one little parenthesis in their logic could mess everything up. So being able to actually test it is, is important. Um, so when you do automated functional testing independent of the contractor, again, you can be keeping an eye on the conditions of every downstream box and automatically figure out, you know, are the, are the, are the resets working properly. I mentioned radiant systems earlier. Um, just want to throw that one up there to, uh, again, emphasize the point that duration of a test is less of a concern when you're automating it, because you can run it whenever. It's not taking up your time. You spend 20 minutes reviewing the results after an eight-hour test. OK, so um, before we get to questions, I want to do a deep dive on one particular type of equipment, just to kind of give you some in the weeds of what a automated functional test could look like. So these were, this was a project with um, uh, a handful of water source heat pumps, um, two elementary schools in Washington State, I believe is where this one was. And um, one thing I highlighted here is the runtime for this test script was all day. We started at midnight and finished, uh, uh, I think, around 8 p.m. So uh, maybe old notes here for saying 23 hours. But the um, point is, is yeah, with a computer, you have the luxury to extend that duration however you want. Um, I, I thinned out some of my notes here in the bottom, but um, one thing I just wanted to point out is for folks here that have been exposed to or attempted to do monitoring based commissioning in existing buildings. One of the nightmare scenarios that we run into all the time is overloading the network. Older control systems can have all sorts of things that make network traffic a major issue. It could be even physical, like loose little wires in the daisy chained, um, uh, uh, you know, MSTP trunks. It could be it's usually associated with multiple vendors having served that site. So there's different controllers, different installers, less accountability. Um, so one of the um, uh, luxuries, again, with automating testing is we can do batches. Um, so here you see we, we plan to do um, a third of the units uh, at a time. Um, and just to make sure, we turned off trend data collection on all the other units just to reduce network traffic. And when you're looking at it from a computer's perspective, you don't even have to look at the network diagram to know which MSTP trunk everything is on. It comes with the address. So you can easily say, I want to run no more than 30% of the devices on any given MSTP trunk. An MSTP trunk is a weak point. So that's, that's, why, that's why I bring that up. OK, so now um, I wanted to bring up the points again. So I, 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 had, a, I, had, a, I had a points list example earlier in the presentation with this very same project, and I showed a bunch of points that we're pulling from the water source heat pump. Well, we also care about the water that's coming to the water source heat pump. So we need to get those points too. So here's, um, we're gonna run through a script. So at 12.30 a.m., uh, the script starts. Um, and we're just observing. And the goal here is to see what happens for optimum start. How many of you, well, I won't put you on the spot like that. But um, it's just not often that you get to observe optimum start. Okay, let's just put it that way. Um, so to be able to test optimum start is a tricky thing to do, or you're going to have to get up real early. Um, optimum start sequences are learning sequences. You can't just make them happen at 2 in the afternoon. It doesn't work that way. It's not, that's not the way the programming works. So being able to observe an optimum start sequence after it's been running for a couple weeks is, is really the only effective way you can, you can test it. So have the computer watch on your behalf. Then at, um, I don't think I put a time in here because uh, we found that this was actually a occupied school. So how many, how many, again, a rhetorical question, how many times are you asked to do functional testing in a new construction project, but the people already moved in? So now you're, you're like, you're in people's way. So being able to do 
functional testing, again, program it and schedule it whenever you want is a big deal. So in this case, we did, we observed optimum start uh, at, uh, I think they had some units starting at 5, 5.30, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., you know, during the weeks of retesting that we had to do. How many times is retesting required? Uh, which is easy to do when you automate it and just press it to run again. Uh, uh, the, the multiple weeks we ran retesting, um, the schedules kept on changing. You know, whoever had access to the schedules, you know, change stuff. So we just set the computer to automatically identify when it goes occupied somewhere between 5 and 7 in the morning. Then ask the key question for optimum start effectiveness, how are all the space temperatures? Are they within set point? Um, so that's a functional question we can answer. Now you see some other googly gop um, up above it in terms of functional questions. It's a lot to take in, um, but it's important. Is the the, in this case, in a lot of terminal units or zone level equipment, you have these effective heating and cooling set points that are calculated from a combination of other things. You got the local set point on the wall, you got the BAS set points in the, on the graphics, you might have global set points and a little checkbox that says whether to use the global set points or not. In this case, we also had occupancy sensors for set back temperatures by two or three degrees, so if occupancy is detected, then it's not set back or whatever. So validating, and you'll see this throughout the test, throughout the day, every couple hours we ask, are these being calculated properly? So that you can see when, you know, when there's actual occupancy and when there's not actual occupancy, is it doing it right? These are details that we don't have time to do in a manual process. So this, again, the luxury of automating testing enables us to do this. Um, next mode that we test is, um, at 4 p.m., so after most of the folks have been leaving this occupied elementary school, we started doing occupied mode testing. Now, I highlighted a couple things here. These are the types of details that matter for automated testing. Again, it was this um, uh, heating set point max and min. We had to expand those for the duration of the test so that we could do some, you know, have a little bit more latitude to exercise the systems. Um, and we'll get back to, um, actually, let me go back to the uh, beginning here. The beginning here, the first step, document existing conditions. That's key. The contractor wants to know this too. Is you got a third party, uh, you or whoever you're using to help you with this technology, um, overriding things on the control system, independent of the controls contractor. They want to know, or you want to know, that you're leaving things the way you found it. So we document you want to document at the beginning of the test what all the set points are. Now you got that documented permanently. And then you'll see at the end of the test, we'll document it again. Um, so uh, uh, let's see here. So, so around uh, 4 p.m. we started the, no, the uh, occupied mode testing, no load. So we make sure that uh, the overrides here, um, besides the um, heating set point max and min, the key thing here is to make sure that the heating and cooling set points are on either side of current space temperature. That's just, uh, that's just code. You just say, whatever current space temperature is, put the set points, you know, three degrees on either side. Um, you see another set point we adjusted here is there's a, a point called set point offset. Um, uh, when we started the project, it was at two degrees, which caused excessive cycling. So the commissioning provider uh, requested for that to be changed, I think maybe to three degrees, four degrees, I don't quite remember. But we wanted to change it for testing, we wanted to change it to a six degree spread so that we could have a little bit more time, you know, because some zones you put on heat and you could go two, three degrees in, you know, 15 minutes. Uh, and we saw that in this case, in this, on this project. In other zones it could take an hour for two, three degrees to change in the space. So, um, uh, spreading that range a little bit wider was, uh, was helpful as a practical uh, purpose. Um, then uh, we asked some questions about what you expect to see in a no-load condition. Um, and of course you see um, uh, every time we're asking are the effective heating and cooling set points being calculated properly in accordance with the schedule and the occupancy sensors. Um, then we go on to uh, can't see this, I'm gonna move this side. Uh, uh, oh yeah, CO2 mode. So we can do, you know, you can do, you can, audit. again, anything you ask the contractor to do in terms of forcing modes of operation, you can do it through the control system. So uh, in this case, we dropped the CO2 set point, 
uh, to 200 uh, ppm below the current space CO2 to force that demand controlled ventilation scenario. And then we ask some questions about that, um, about that condition. And then we go to um, cooling mode with economizer. Now this was, I believe we did testing around this project. If testing is usually only supposed to be, what, a few weeks? I, I see lots of projects where testing spreads over months on small projects even just because of the nature of solving things, have, things have to be solved. But, so this was in the winter, I believe. So we had to override the outdoor air temperature sensor to force that uh, economizer condition. So that was the override that, that happened, uh, uh, one of the key overrides to make this condition happen. And of course, we changed the, the space set points as well. And we asked functional questions about the data. And all of these functional questions on the bottom are answerable by the data, by a computer. Uh, so then we go on to the next mode, uh, cooling with the economizer disabled. So again, we override the outdoor air temperature to a uh, condition that was outside the range of the sequence for enabling the economizer so that we can see that. And then we ask questions about it. How are we doing on time? Uh, 12.03. Okay. And um, then uh, uh, we're not going to go through the details of the unoccupied modes, but we have uh, we go through a, a bunch of unoccupied modes as well. And in this case, that happened, uh, I think, 6 p.m. or later uh, on this particular project. So, um, and then repeat. We'll do it again and again. And, and like many projects, retesting, Retesting is something you want to avoid when you're doing a traditional approach. And you, you generally hear people will budget at least for one retest. Um, and there's a lot built into that because you're not actually retesting everything. It's more spot checking. Uh, with automated uh, functional testing, it's again a luxury. You can do the entire robust testing as many times as you want without taking your labor. Well, you still need to re re review the results. Uh, never want to forget to say that. But uh, then to end a test, uh, documenting um, existing that we left the control system the way we found it. So um, the way we do it is we, you know, we, all the um, set points that we overrode throughout the test, we just ask one kind of sweeping question at the end. Did all those set points match what they were when we started uh, the test, in this case at 12.30 AM or whatever? Um, and so that's a good validation of you left it the way you found it. So that is all I had for you. I wanted to leave some, uh, some time for questions. Anybody got any, any questions or particular something you might want to dig in on, uh, on this topic? Yes. Yes, sir. Do you Thank you. Do any sort of naming convention for your points when they're putting all those points in, try to make them intuitive? Yes, uh, just like, uh, so the question was um, uh, about naming conventions. So you'll find all sorts of junk in the control system. Everybody has different naming conventions and it's a big deal. So I would say yes, I mean the approach that we like to use is, is our own naming conventions that we think are logical, uh, but I, I can't say they're the best ones. <laughs> uh, everybody's got different ones and, um, um, uh, but you know, I guess when you use some sort of analytics technology to make a process like this happen, you're holding the keys to the process. And if you have your standard point names you like to use, you can have every single project, whether it's train, JCI, you know, ALC, whatever, uh, whoever controls engineers set up that project, you, for your view, can have all the same naming conventions. I mean, that's, and that's how, that's how we do it. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. When, when you set up your testing, you command for a certain period of time, like say four o'clock, you're going to command each point, one point at a time. How does it run each individual test? And is it spanned over a period of time? We're gonna run this test for an hour uh, and then collect that trend data. How does that work? So uh, when we started doing this automated testing, we only collected trend data during the test. So, um, and that could be customized anywhere from an hour to, you know, as you saw in an example, one was 23 hour long test. 
Um, nowadays, we realize that, uh, geez, just having access to trend data, regardless of automated testing, is valuable. So um, we normally will start collecting trend data as soon as we make a connection, which is usually a matter of weeks before functional testing is supposed to start. So you've got access to trend data continuously during that process, before and after your eventual functional testing. When we do the automated test, we do it in batches. So you're asking about, um, you know, do we override one point at a time? If we're looking at, um, say, we're worried about network traffic or practical concern of not swinging 100% of the building into full cooling at once, because that's not what it was designed to do, we may do something like one third of the terminal units on each floor. And so at, uh, at, a, at a, so let's say here, occupied heating mode, um, well, I don't have a timestamp on here in, this, um, in the script here, but it would be at a specific point in time. Like at 2.15 p.m., one third of the space set points on each floor will be changed at the same time. So it's just a bulk command, if you will. Is that? And uh, there was a question uh, up here with this gentleman. Um, how receptive have been the controls contractors with doing this on their systems? And is there a lot of pushback? And if so, how do you overcome that? Great this question. like additional risk for them to be able to do this. Yeah, that's, uh, that's usually the first reaction. Um, and so uh, the way uh, we handle it is, um, well, as with lots of things in the commissioning world, uh, you know, there's an art to, uh, to communication as much as anything. But um, what we've seen the best, um, the best uh, process is where the commissioning agent introduces the stakeholders to the uh, automated process as this is what we are doing. Um, uh, just the way you phrase it, you know. But, but really, to get to the heart of your question, they've all been receptive. At the end of the day, it's gonna save them time. They get to continue doing their work, doing their things that they're, they claim that were already done, they're still working on. Um, and so connecting to their control system, the way we do it is we schedule a, um, a stakeholder call and it enables them to ask their questions. So wait, you're overriding, how are you doing your overrides? Like, so a common question that comes up is um, with BACnet, typical control, um, commands uh, are, um, I know there's high level uh, BACnet experts in here that, that, that'll know this detail uh, better than me, but something like um, a level 13 priority is standard um, control system commands. And then emergency stuff is like level one or two, something like that. Uh, it's normal for manual overrides to be level, I wanna say seven or eight. Um, so that's what we do our overrides on. So that's a conversation we have in that 20 to 30 minute stakeholder call. And um, every single time the contractor, they're, you know, they wanna lean in on the idea of doing automated testing. They don't wanna be the one to say no, but you know they're concerned about it. And so we get on a call and we talk through those issues, explain to them how it works. And what I've found is that at the end of the day, when they realize that they don't have to sit there with you and do that testing, it, is, it becomes, yeah. heck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, question here. Um, it would appear that the focus is on terminal unit side, right? We talked about sampling and, and the focus of trying to get to that other 90 or 80% of, of those units. What has been the response from the commissioning providers on the time that it takes to triage all of those new issues that have been collected or found through this process? I'm sure it's not a small amount, right? The intent is to, to, to find these and, and correct them. What has been that level of response? So, it's a loaded question, uh, a good one. Um, so, it is uh, 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 the responsibility of the commissioning provider to triage those problems. So, the technology helps us laser in on where the issues are rather than having to look at everything um, and sp go in detail to everything. We use a, um, a bulk tool where you can see you know, how many boxes failed this or that and then get rid of the uh, high level issues, the systemic issues. Then we'll run a retest uh, and, and then drill in on the little issues. 
And the little issues, when you see them electronically, you just make a, 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 you know, a, an issue and create your issues log electronically right there while you're reviewing it. But reviewing the data is important. And we have had some customers, commissioning providers, a handful that view that come into this thinking it's a lazy type of thing where um, wow I'm gonna take functional testing off your plate no 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 this is gonna help you do functional testing better and better can mean more rigorous but you're swapping triage at hundred percent of the units versus traditional manual approach on twenty percent of the units that's where you get your time savings but yeah that's really important um, you can't get rid of the triage by a professional. That's important. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here, yeah, here. you, you talked about going into backnet devices and being able to override points, and that's pretty standard. What happens when you run into um, a control system that has a proprietary black box? How are you documenting what mode it's in at that point? Because a lot of times what happens is they'll turn off the black box test out the points, turn the back black box on, and then you come back and you find out you've got system problems. And that's usually at the, at the head end of the system. You know, one of these optimization situations where you don't know whether it's reset, static pressure, you don't know what's caused a failure, but you have a failure. How do you document what the mode is in that black box world? Okay, so um, I'm getting a couple things out of that question that I think are worth addressing. One. The whole concept of a black box um, it makes me think proprietary. So you know, new construction or new control systems, um, I don't know, 99% of them are going to be back net and they have to follow certain rules. Now, there are ways to hinder getting access to certain things, but those are overcomable and they're publicized in the uh, user documentation for the control system. Now, resets, as an example, is something that's done at the supervisory level. So, you know, at the JACE or at the, um, uh, the workstation or something. Um, comfort index. Com com okay, comfort index. Um, well, I don't quite know how to respond to that, but there's lots of supervisory aspects going on. Um, well, we, we, if those aren't in place, then we can't test them. So you mentioned also, like, optimization, like there's, there's third-party remote optimization software. Um, so if you have like, a, I don't know, I think there's one called Optimum or something, Optimum Energy or something. They, um, it's cloud-based. There's others that are doing digital twin type stuff and um, machine learning and whatever. Like it's, 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 it's manipulating set points in a way that's hard for a human to understand why. Um, I mean, you got that same problem whether, whether we're trying to automate the test or not. But if, that, if there's something going on after we leave the project, then we, yeah, we can't, we can't test that. Um, but in terms of proprietary stuff, you know, BACnet is, is open. So if we come across, now on existing buildings, when you're doing monitoring-based commissioning, we come across um, older proprietary control systems that, yeah, we can't, we can't do anything with. So that's just not a good application. Now, you'll usually see in those scenarios, or often you'll see Tritium Niagara as the translator to all these old proprietary uh, protocols. So Tritium has a nice, um, you know, in haystack kind of um, open-ish way of connecting and seeing everything. So that's how we get through that. Uh, but yeah, if it's a proprietary system, then you, we can't do anything with it. And where we've run into that is um, uh, lately is uh, greenhouse controls. Um, there seems to be a lot of commissioning going on in greenhouse controls for R&D purposes um, and for new markets. And, uh, and uh, those greenhouse controls, I forget the brand, but there's some European-based controls company. It's totally proprietary. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't do anything with it. Now, they could create an API, and they do have an API on certain things, but, um, but that's just not a good application. So, we, we, we apply automated commissioning to um, anything BACnet or anything Niagara. And, uh, and there are always ways to work through other stuff, but it's time, labor, cost, blocks. People block you. Does that, that kind of answer your question there? All right. It, it is 12.15. Do you have time for one more question? I do. Derek? Wherever you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got a quick question. Since, yes, sir. You know, you said something about 
having things done overnight. The whole thing about doing this override, isn't there a risk management issue that you're overriding someone else's controls don't, when they're not fully functional yet? Sure, sure. And as the commissioning provider and directing the test, you get to decide when it's appropriate to run the test. I will say, though, that a lot of projects have taken that option. Um, uh, uh, and when we're talking terminal unit level type of stuff, there's less risk issues. Now, to, um, I will say there's also some benefits of doing the testing at night, of finding things that you wouldn't ever find. Uh, I know there was a university project uh, up in Atlanta where we ran, uh, we ran testing during the day and at night, uh, just the retesting, you know, we, we just moved it around and whenever we did it. When we ran it at night once, the, um, the, there were three air handlers in parallel, and during the morning start, uh, uh, two of them are supposed to ramp up slowly. Like, like one starts and then another one starts shortly thereafter. And that worked great, worked beautifully. But in the middle of the night, when we had an unoccupied call for cooling, nothing's crazy, you know, just we wanted to test. You know, I think the sequence said if three zones were call for an unoccupied cooling. So we triggered three zones, to, three specifically, to call for unoccupied cooling. And the, um, the air handlers did not do their soft ramp. And, um, and, and they crashed with safety. They, they crashed on high duck limit, and that stopped it. So that was perhaps a risk, but you know, that also identified something that nobody would have identified otherwise. So risk mitigation is, never disappears. It still has to, you know, there's issues. Uh, yeah, but, I was just thinking it's only it, risk mitigation works fine when you're there and you're directing the. Uh, the the ship to make it happen, but when you're doing it remotely, I was just wondering if you're bringing on, for the commissioning agent, bringing on any more undue risk management to them, you know, for themselves, that where they could be liable that they crashed the system and it's, they, the finger now points at them where we're supposed to be the guys that group everybody together and they be the cohesive unit. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, that, that's a concern. Yes. And less of a concern on zone level equipment, but, um, but yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you.